Welcome to this workshop on creating user adaptive interfaces. You made the right choice today in which workshop you chose because this one is jam packed with tons of goodness. Um, and I'm glad we have extra time. I've given this workshop before and I might have uh, diverged a little bit and you know um, embellished some areas and went over time. But guess what? We have enough time today for me to embellish as much as I want. And, well, not as much as I want, but enough. And I think that means you're going to get a better presentation today than I gave before. Um, also, I'll share a link to it at some point, but I have the other video, the one that I did at Google I.O. that's only 45 minutes instead of this one that's going to go over an hour. Um, and it'll probably give you a whole bunch of different information because I'm not going to necessarily be reading a script. I'm going to be very much trying to describe to you how I think about building interfaces, how I think about my CSS when I'm writing it, and just what my mentality is. And you'll find that it's very user-centered. I'm building very much for a wide audience. I want the audience to show up and have an experience that just feels right. They shouldn't even need to uh, think about user settings. They should just show up. The web page should render really fast and it should have all of the necessary um, kind of conveniences that we've come to know and love about this magic paper called a web page, right? It delivers this content to you and it just form fits to your screen and looks beautiful and has buttons that are tappable and all sorts of good stuff, but we can do better. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's talk about a little bit um, before we begin, like what we're building. We'll preview what it is. Like here's our interface here on the right. I've got, uh, it's a settings page. And so this is a form. There's a, a form wrapping both of these little content sections here. And the goal here is someone's gonna be coming to your application, coming to your setting uh, settings page and setting settings inside your app. And that settings page is gonna be reading a bunch of user preference settings that are coming from the operating system that the browser is passing down to us for us to hook into in our CSS. And we get to adapt our page to this particular user. It's really exciting stuff. It's a growing area. And let's just dig into uh, what I mean by user adaptive. We talked about it a little bit, but users these days have indicated many preferences uh, on, you know, and, and whether that's like their operating system or whatever. So they want the operating system uh, and the apps to look and feel like theirs. User adaptive interfaces are those which are ready to use these preferences to enhance the user experience, to make it feel more at home, to make it feel like it's theirs. Like really, that's truly what we're doing because if it's done correctly, a user may never know that the page has adapted. That I think is the secret here because you can make a user adaptive interface um, but someone might have to choose it in your UI. Maybe you show a light and a dark theme in your interface, which is still a good idea. Um, but those are things that they had to explicitly choose per your page. We're focused mostly today on the ones that come through transparently. Like imagine you got into a car and it just, adjust, well, I mean, they do sometimes adjust the seats for you, but what if it adjusted the font size of the dashboard? What if the music was tuned to your volume? All these sort of things because your presence was in there. And if someone get, else gets in the same car, they get a different customized experience. And we want that to happen without asking. We want these things just to feed right into there. Um, and if you want, you can later add additional ways for someone to toggle these. But this is where we're uh, headed towards now. It should feel at home right away. So what are some of our user preferences that we have to choose from here? Um, device hardware choice is a preference that users have made. Their operating system is a choice. Their apps and their operating system colors are preferences. Their, um, uh, the app and operating system doc document languages and preferences. You could come from a different country and the way that you want to read is a different direction than here in the Americas. And um, the amount of preferences that are present is only seeming to grow. So we're going to tackle a lot of these today and show how CSS can help you wrangle these. A web page is not able to access everything about a user's preferences, uh, and that's for good reason. You can follow that link, but they're essentially fingerprinting vectors where someone can start to track users based on all these preferences. So here's a few examples of things that you can use from your CSS today. You're probably super familiar with this one right here, device viewport size. And the device viewport size would be uh, the size of the actual uh, screen that's being used. So a physical screen, whether it's a big monitor or their phone, these are physical devices and you can query them with CSS to adapt your layout to fit that screen better. You have device orientation. So you can know if something is in landscape or portrait. This becomes really critical for doing adjustments in your layout. We'll do one today. Font size. Right. So in case you haven't adjusted yours, there are multiple places on your phone to adjust your font size. I got fly. Uh, uh, 
Ah, we'll get it maybe. Um, multiple places to adjust your font size. You have your operating system where you can adjust your font size. Maybe your uh, parents have done that. They go into the their phone and they bump up the font size so all the text messages and everything that they get are a little bit larger for them to read. Or maybe you've gone into your operating system and adjusted the font size preference that's in the settings of your browser. Did I say operating system? I meant browser this time. So you can go to your browser and set settings. You can also adjust the font settings on a per page basis with command plus and command minus. All of these are ways for the user to have already brought a font size preference to the page. And you really shouldn't care that much. You want the user to read your stuff. So why don't you make it uh, available to adapt to their uh, preferences? And one of the things that we'll talk about there is relative units and building upon the font size that the user has brought to the table. So instead of setting a font size for the whole page, we're going to build up from whatever it is their base reading preferences. Right? Cool. OK, there's more to go. We have online and offline capabilities. You can check to see if someone's online or offline. Network quality, are they on you know, a high-speed internet or are they on low-speed internet? You can adjust the amount of images you serve them and stuff like that. Color scheme, light and dark. So in their operating system, have they said that they want light or dark in their preference? And this can play right into your page. We're definitely going to work on that one today. Interface animations. So this is uh, the concept of reduced or not. Some people get very queasy from too much animation. And it's usually animation that's out of their control. So today, when we do any of our animations, we're going to focus on doing color crossfades and uh, opacity crossfades, because those won't cause motion sickness. And they're also generally secluded to smaller areas. Um, and we're going to be mindful of anything that does have motion, and we're going to reduce it, which is to media query. We have input quality. So you can know someone's coming from a you know, a really coarse, they call it coarse because it's not very fine. Like a mouse is very fine and it has a really high precision rate and your finger, uh, I don't know about yours, but mine are pretty big and clunky. And uh, you can query for that to see if someone even has uh, a fine pointer or a coarse pointer. And you can adjust the hit area of something like, for example, a checkbox. So we're going to do that today. We're going to adjust checkboxes to be larger for users that are not using a mouse. If they have a coarse uh, input device, we'll give them a larger tap area so that they're you know, humongous fingers uh, can get in there nice and good. We're also going to uh, make sure that this is using logical properties so that we can obey someone's document direction and writing mode. I'm sure you've seen Manga or other different um, publications where the document is a different direction than left to right and top to bottom, which is what we have in Latin or English. How can we make our page just automatically whatever the user's preference is for document direction or writing mode? Uh, we'll show you that. And then this last one here is display mode. So if someone's launching it from a PWA app on their home, home screen where they kind of get more viewport into the um, device, uh, you've got standalone and minimal UI. So these are ways for you to query how this page is being displayed. Are we just in a browser tab or are we kind of launched in a full screen experience and you can adjust your layout based upon that. Here's some things that you can't do, uh, but they're coming soon, which is reduced data or light mode. So if on your operating system, maybe on your desktop or your mobile, you can go say that I would prefer uh, less data, le less network traffic to be used. You can also do this in your browser. Maybe your browser of choice does this for you by default, where there's a light mode, and it does its best to reduce the amount of requests that are being sent to your phone so that you, if you're paying per megabyte, that you don't have to pay as much money. And soon, we have a um, media query that'll let you tap into that to know if they want it reduced or not, and you could serve less images. Color range. Every device uh, these days, it tends to be an HD device, and it has tons and tons and tons of colors, and we need a way to know if uh, the device that this is being viewed on has that capability. And if it has all those colors, uh, we're going to tap into that and show colors that are in that more vibrant range, or maybe in a darker range. Some screens have lots more rich black colors to choose from right, like an OLED screen. OK, and we've got contrast coming. I think this one's actually out, or it's very nearly out. And this is in the operating system. You can specify that you need high contrast, or you need uh, reduced contrast or something. And you can go specify what's your preference in terms of contrast and reading. Some people like light contrast, especially at nighttime, when they're not trying to see you know, vibrating text on a, on a background. So anyway, we can tap into that. And then transparency, whether or not transparency is kind of ruining things for uh, people's vision. They can go specify that in the operating system. They don't like it. And in our apps, we could go reduce our transparency. Pretty cool stuff. So media queries are pretty much what unlocks all of this. CSS and the web enable uh, adaptation and responsiveness through these media queries. A declarative condition that contains a set of styles is that if that condition is true. So the most common being a condition on viewport size of the, the um, device. If the size is less than 800 pixels, like the device has less than 800 pixels, then let's supply some better styles for that particular use case. 
So user adaptive. Again, let's just kind of reco like recap what this is. Like an un let's talk about what an unadaptive interface is. Is one that changes nothing when a user visits it. It is uh, essentially delivering one experience to everyone with no ability to adjust it anywhere from the operating system or um, any buttons that are in the page. A user adaptive interface could have five different appearances and styles for five different users. The functionality is the exact same, but the aesthetics are perceived better, and the usability of the interface is easier for users who can adjust to the UI. Right? It's adjusted for them. Their preferences that they've clearly articulated are just there on the page. And at that point, they think about less. And when they have to think about less, they're going to focus on the task that they're there for, there for more. So today, what we're going to build is uh, we're going to build a user adaptive form that adapts to the following different criteria. The system color scheme, that's um, the preference by offering a light and dark color scheme for users and the surrounding UI elements. And so this whole page, so here, look, we can even toggle it right here in DevTools. Here's the dark theme. We have some nice dark colors. Everything is still within the sort of brand uh, blue that's in this page. And then we have the light theme. And we're going to do that on all custom properties, and we'll build that from the ground up today. The system motion preferences by offering multiple types of animation. As I tab through here with my keyboard, you can see that there's a grow here. There's a color transition here. The color on the background of this whole element here is all uh, is uh, lighter to show that there's a focus here. And we see a focus ring around the interactive element. And we'll talk about how we get those things and how we're going to reduce motion. So here, if I go to emulate reduced motion, I can emulate reduced. And see as I tab through, we no longer grow this animation. It just instantly becomes larger. And we are still cross-fading the colors, though. So kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, I love how the background fades in and out with these different sections. Anyway, very cool. Uh, we're going to look at small and large device viewports to offer mobile and desktop experiences. Specifically, we're going to go into landscape uh, on mobile and ensure that we see both of these sections side by side. Right? If I'm going to swap this landscape, I should see this type of landscape layout here. Whereas if I didn't write the media query, it would be a single column. And on a mobile device on landscape, I'm like, why you get, why is it single column? I just thought I would get two. So anyway, we're going to go make sure that that's in there. We're going to accept various input types like keyboard, screen reader, touch, and mouse. And we'll talk about how we adapt to these different methods of input that people want to, they need to make choices and cause a change in the UI. How do we make sure that we're adapting to all these different user types? And we want to make sure that any language and reading mode uh, works great. We should be able to come into the uh, elements panel here. At the very top, we can change the direction to right to left and look at most of it. Oh, it looks like we have a little bit of a padding issue here. Maybe we'll debug that today. I'm interested to see what that regression was. Probably a lack of a mar like a uh, logical property. <gasps> we have a bug maybe we're going to get to solve. OK, cool. So those are what we're uh, working towards today. And this is essentially what it starts like. As you can see, this little stark image here, here is what we start with. So in terms of like saving time, I've provided the HTML today. The HTML will come with various things. And we'll talk uh, about some of it as we go. But this is the default styles. We have only a little bit of CSS here to make sure our SVG aren't um, looking humongous. I could have put some inline sizes on them there, but I decided to put that style here. And we're going to build this up from this skeleton. So we have a strong foundation of a form that is already usable as it is. You could submit this to the data, the server, and you could you know, use JavaScript to see what all these values are. It's a usable form as it is. It's just not adapting, and it looks kind of crusty. So we're going to fix all that. Things that we're going to learn, we're going to learn, uh, let's see, how to make light and dark themes. Light and dark themes. Uh, you'll, I'll show you my strategy for doing that with custom properties. We're going to build animated and accessible forms, which we've already looked at. We're going to lay out responsive forms. There's lots of cool layout stuff coming. And we're going to use relative units and logical properties. And uh, I think we're going to solve a bug, too. I'm really interested. I'm glad we have some extra time. I am curious at what is there. OK, uh, let's see. This code lab is focused on user adaptive interfaces, non-relevant concepts, and code blocks are glossed over. Yeah, I just talked about that. Like the HTML, um, it's not an HTML lesson today. We're going to be focusing on the CSS, and we have plenty to talk about in just the CSS alone. So let's go to the next section, getting set up. Hopefully, everybody uh, can uh, see these pages. And if they want to, they can follow along. It'll give you this link to this code pen. So here, I'll just uh, copy this link and paste it in the chat for anybody who is uh, doesn't have this open or doesn't want to. So everything you need is also in the GitHub repository here. So you can go here and fork um, or just clone the repository and build it and, and work uh, locally if you like, if you don't want to work online with CodePen. And uh, I think the CodePen path is really easy today. So we're going to work on that one. And I'm going to go ahead and fork this right now. 
Excellent. Let's see, this is going to be CDS 2021 workshop. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and if you don't have an account, create one to save the work, uh, click fork. Okay, you can also work locally. So we'll skip through here. If you want to run the project, there's some install steps there. It's not that big a deal. Uh, you don't have to use Node, but Node is how the project was built by default. It uses the um, build tool called Vite, which I'm a really big fan of. Uh, very unobtrusive, very minimal, very fast, uh, and pretty much just lets you write whatever you want. It has, it has very... Uh, I don't know, it's just very unopinionated, which I like. Uh, OK, so about the HTML, this lesson covers aspects of the HTML used to support user adaptive interactivity. So this workshop has a specific focus on CSS. And when we're ready to start, let's just uh, let's get started in here. We're ready to begin our first set of CSS. All right, so in this section, adaptive interactions, um, we're going to have, by the end of it, we're going to have gamepad and keyboard support. We're going to have mouse and touch support, and we're going to have screen reader or similar assistive technology support. I like to start here. The HTML is very foundational, and it's the way that you can reach into um, assistive technology, screen readers, and keyboard is just having strong structural markup that represents the goal of your interface really well. So some attributes for the HTML. The HTML provided in the source is a great starting point because semantic elements help group, order, and label your form inputs. If we look over here, we've got a form element with a section inside. There's going to be two sections. There's a header for each one of those sections. And then the field set element is the thing that's got the border around it that's wrapping each of these sections. Each of the field sets is going to have a field set item class with a picture that's got an icon, another little stack, a grid stack that we'll see here in a second, um, a label, and an input. And we'll talk about some of those things um, and why they were put that way. So forms are a key interaction for a point of business. It's important that the form can adapt to many types of input the web can facilitate. For example, it's likely or it's likely important to have a form that's usable on mobile uh, with touch, right? This is usually kind of 101 right now that you need to have that. And in this section before layout and style, we're going to ensure that we have adaptive input so that, yeah, your finger or your mouse both get um, a great treatment on this uh, design. So grouping inputs, the field set element in the HTML is for grouping similar inputs and controls together. In your form, we have two groups, one for volume and one for notifications. This is the important, uh, this is important to the user experience, uh, so whole sections can be skipped. Ordering elements, the order of the elements is provided in a logical order. You can see here if I just click in here, so right now it's in a single column. I can uh, click into our thing and tab through and see um, our tab experience. So it tabs through uh, logically. This is how we'd expect to tab through. And we'll talk about that more later. Um, users of the web have become accustomed to moving through their forms with their tab key. I think it's critical, sometimes way faster than even using a mouse, uh, which fortunately the browser takes care of most of this for us. So using elements like button, input, H2, and label automatically become keyboard or screen reader destinations. Right? I can tab into this uh, over here and hit left and right and toggle these values um, without any JavaScript. And uh, with Hall, and I can do it multiple ways from multiple different device types. And the browser is just going to do that for us. Some of the freebies we get. So the above video demonstrates how that tab key and arrows move through it. Just showed that in person. But the blue outline, look, as I tab into it, look, it's like shrink wrapped on there. It's very tight around the input el input elements. So let's add the following styles to make the interaction have some breathing room. So we're going to start with a focus style on our inputs. And go ahead and just pop that right in the bottom of our CSS. Now, as I tab through, look, we have some space. Ah, space is one of those weird things that when you add it, it just sort of gives things a little bit. It just it goes a long way, having a lot of good space. Things that look shrink-wrapped often feel cramped, and they just, they're just they not as inviting as something that has space. So things to try. Uh, in case we're in here, we already did tab and shift tab. We moved around. We changed some of the values. Right, I can tab down here into these check marks, uh, which are also inputs. So notice they have additional space. And I can hit spacebar to toggle those. And if we had a Bluetooth gamepad, you could move through the form as well and hit just A on your controller or on your switch and watch these uh, values go up and down. Super fun. OK, let's do something for the mouse interaction. Uh, users of the web have become accustomed to interacting with the forms with their mouse. I mean, yeah, mouses are pretty uh, popular. Uh, try using your mouse on the form. Sliders and checkboxes work, but we can do better. Those checkboxes are pretty small, even for a mouse. Uh, those are tiny. So let's uh, enhance the way that this works. So how you get two, uh, let's see, see how you get two user experience connecting labels and inputs? Ah, yes, let's talk about labels and inputs. So right now, if we didn't have a label that had this attribute four here, you can see this is four media volume, and then we have an input down here that's named media volume. Uh, this is important because without those, notice how the default layout here is a block level layout, and our checkbox is above 
the label, and then there's even some messaging text. It honestly looks like this checkbox belongs to get notified, but that's not the case. By using a label and uh, connecting them through the HTML, I can now click on the label itself to toggle the checkbox value. And when I hover over the label, I don't know if you can see it in here, but when I hover over the label, let me zoom out a little bit, you can see the color of it change. And that's because the browser is signaling to the user that this is an interactive label with that checkbox. So we're uh, connecting them together for screen readers and we're connecting them together for mouse users as well so that they know which label and which checkbox have a relationship there. It's an explicit connection that improves the user experience for screen readers and pretty much everyone. Right, so here's an example of no association and then an example of having the association. Some 101 uh, form creation right there, but those are some of the user experience benefits we get from that. So I already put those inside of the HTML. Let's talk about screen reader interaction. So assistive, assistive technology can interact with this form and with a few HTML attributes can make the user experience even smoother. So notice here in this video, as I tabbed through uh, with a screen reader, it's stopping on things that aren't important for someone who can't see, like the icon. Um, they don't need to know the icon. They just need to know the label, call volume, and the input slider itself. Maybe they even need to just go through the sliders, and the sliders can tell a label to the screen reader. So for users navigating the current form with the screen reader in Chrome, which, by the way, is Command F5, is a really great way to invoke your screen reader on Mac. Um, we have an unnecessary stop at the picture element, but we can fix that by adding aria hidden true to the picture. So if we scroll in here, we can see that the um, aria picture uh, are you hidden true is already present and as I tab through it's skipping those icons now And that's just nice. You're you're helping screen reader users not have unnecessary stops with just a little bit of HTML to add into there and we can see here now, it's also different. Using tab on your keyboard is not the same thing as using a screen reader. Screen readers will stop on more items than the tab key will and you can see that here where the label and the input are both getting stopped on in this video. And so it's a good example. Uh, it's a good idea here, down here, in things to try, uh, to try figuring out what screen reader is built into your operating system. Give it a try. I think you'll uh, find a lot of interesting things and a lot of interesting powers it has. Um, like it can jump all over the page, whereas like the tab key can only really go linearly, like down or up. Um, the screen reader technology can jump right to various sections, and pros of it can really navigate around the site really well. Okay, let's go to the next section where we get to start doing some layouts. Since most of those HTML attributes and things were already done for us other than this outline um, offset that we put in here. Also, outline offset can be animated and there's like a really cool snippet uh, that we could add maybe later that will animate that on focus. So on focus, it kind of grows to the space that we want it there. And we'll see if we get there. Okay, adaptive layouts. Oh, by the way, if there's any um, questions, like, like I see, I think one that's popping up right here, there's a triangle, square, and circle in the very bottom right of this Google Meet that uh, we have here, and there's something called activities and something called Q&A. If you have a question, I'd love for you to put it there, and we'll go through these at the end when there's extra time and try to burn through as many of these questions and answers as we can. So try to funnel your questions into the Q&A section of the activities of Google Meet. All right, in the adaptive layout section, by the end, we're gonna have created a spacing system with custom properties and relative units. We're gonna write CSS grid for flexible, responsive alignment and spacing. We're gonna use logical properties for internationally adaptive layouts. That's just so much fun to say. And we're gonna write meta queries to adapt between compact and spacious layouts. Yes, so we're gonna turn that crusty little form over here that does no responding really other than it's liquid uh, and we're gonna turn it into what we see here in the middle on the left where it's still bones but you can tell that by having a layout and right spacing it gets you a lot of the way into getting this done. All right, let's kick this off. A nice uh, key to a nice layout is a limited palette of spacing options. This helps uh, content find natural alignments and harmonies. Well, it's, it's probably opinionated on my part, but um, I do think that a less is more mentality does help you here. So custom properties, this workshop builds upon a set of seven custom property sizes. Let's just put these right into style.css. I'm gonna grab this root tag, go to the top of my style section, hit paste. I'm actually gonna bring this up because we're gonna spend a lot more time in the CSS section. Okay, and you look at the names, we have like extra, extra small, extra small, small, and look at the relative units. We have 0.25 rem, 0.5 rem, 1 rem, 1 and a half rem, 2 rem, 3 rem, 6 rem, and that's the sort of ramp up uh, of spacing that I created in here. 
And I like this naming for these custom properties. These are, you know, these are global custom properties because I think this is verbiage that you might find uh, in your day to day with someone. Someone might say, hey, uh, will you make that spacing extra large? And you can say, why yes. And that's literally the name of the custom property uh, because I've aligned it with the way that we talk about it. And that's just kind of nice. You, and then I also use rem units for exclusively legible whole unit sizing that adapts and is mindful of a user's preference. So if you haven't studied rems yet about and why they're um, relative to user's preferences, there's a link here for you to check out. Um, but the I like the whole unit side of sizing here too. And like notice how we have one, two, three, and six. We have a quarter rem, a half rem, and one and a half rem. There's not a whole lot of like 0.875s or kind of awkward um, to think about sizing um, or like 14 pixels versus 18 and stuff like that. I really like thinking about like one rem. I also find that one rem is something that I use a lot where it's just like generic spacing, one rem. Uh, it's a healthy amount of space between um, the two items. And one rem, also I'll just briefly go into how this is a user preference is when the user can change their operating system font size or they change the font size in their browser or if they zoom, the rem unit is going to be respectful to that size that comes in. So one rem will equal the base font size of their preference. And you can build up from there. And I find that it's really healthy to think about that way. So these extra small and extra extra small, these are underneath that um, particular user's preference size. But we're not going to set font sizes to anything like this. Like I like to set my base font size at one rem, and we'll probably get there too. But then it's setting the stage for I'm respecting user's preferences and I'll build up from there. Let's do some page styles. So next you need to set some document styles, remove margins from elements and set the font size to a nice sans serif. All right, so we'll add the following CSS. You could kind of think of this CSS as a reset and you're not wrong, um, but it's a pretty um, minimal reset. There are much stronger resets that you can go use. And since I'm starting from scratch, this is okay for me to use. Maybe it's not okay for you to, to you know, zero out all the margins of every element, but look at how we squeezed everything down. And that's because we're going to be using CSS grid and gap today to space out our elements. And so we take out all the margins so that we can exclusively work with uh, gap. I find gap to be just a delight as well as CSS grid. And we'll get into how CSS grid is also the only layout tool that we're going to use today. I love Flexbox. I got nothing against Flexbox, but grid stole the show in this particular layout. So we'll get there. Okay, so uh, this is our first use of some of the spacing custom properties. This begins our space journey. Play on words, uh, cheesy. Okay, um, and let's talk about some of the logical properties in here. So box sizing, border box, and margin zero. Um, hopefully you're familiar with why it's nice to set box sizing to border box by default. Uh, the default is content box, and I think most people expect the border box to be contributing to the size of the element. So anyway, we're gonna treat it that way today. Now this is interesting, HTML block size 100%. The page, by default, is only as tall as the content. And there's two parent elements before you even get to that size of the content. You have the HTML, and then underneath that, you have the body. The HTML and the body both have a size, but they're sized on their content. Like I said, we want, I think most people expect, the page uh, that you load to at least be the height of the viewport. So by setting HTML block size 100% and block size is equivalent to height in most scenarios here in logical properties, we'll get into more logical property definition in a second. We're telling the HTML document explicitly, notice it's not min height or max height, we're saying height 100%. HTML, you need to be the size of the viewport. And then critically, the body element here says min block size 100%. So that way the body can grow beyond the viewport, become scrollable inside of that 100% space. So if you've ever used 100VH, uh, you're probably going for a, a result similar to something like this, where you want it to fit the viewport, but there's like some side effects with 100% or 100VH, and that's a whole other story. That's why we're getting 100DVH, 100SVH. Uh, we're getting new viewport height units to account for the fluctuation that 100VH is not always 100 VH of what you think it is. So anyway, by using HTML as block size 100% and body as min block size 100%, you set yourself up for the uh, a full viewport um, experience that doesn't have to any of the side effects of VH units. So this is kind of a hot tip if you're um, building something that needs to be the full viewport height. And this comes in critical for our layout because we're eventually going to center these. Let's see, where's our demo? We're eventually going to center this in the page and we want to have that height set there. So then we have padding block start and padding block end. We could have used the shorthand here, but this is saying padding block top, essentially, and padding block end. So for Latin, these are both going to be in, in an English language that's like, okay, so like you're, 
um, your paragraphs stack on top of each other, right? You can think of paragraphs like blocks. You could think of text like your handwriting as inline. The letters go left to right, but the paragraphs stack on top of each other. Those are blocks and inline. And the block start is going to be the top of the block, and the block end is the bottom. So essentially, we're padding the body on the top and the bottom with our var space extra small. And it doesn't really do much very, uh, here yet, but on mobile, it became really important that you had some space on the top and the bottom. Okay, that was a pretty long explanation for our first little snippet, but hopefully you're like, whoa, this has already got stuff in it that I wasn't expecting. Um, and we'll just, it's going to keep coming in, so be excited. All right, let's do some typography. So the font for this layout is adaptive. The font for this layout is adaptive. The system UI keyword will use whatever the user's operating system has decided is the optimal interface font, right? Okay, so here we go. Let's just drop it in. Boom. Drop in a few of these. Okay. Well, it looks like body. I'm just going to go ahead and throw body up in here. Not required if you're following along, but I'm going to anyway, just for cleanliness. Okay, so font family, system UI, and then I have a fallback of sans serif. System UI is kind of newish. It's not that new, but if you want, you can provide a fallback of sans serif, which will probably be like Helvetica. It just depends on what the operating system is. So notice I'm not setting, so this is our body font. This is like our text font. This is just, we want it to be legible. I always like making my web pages look as much like a native app as possible, since that's where most people are spending a lot of their time outside of the browser. And so when they visit the browser and they visit my experience, if I'm using system UI, if they're on Linux, they're gonna pull in the system uh, Linux font. And that means my web page will look just like an app looks. Uh, if you're on Mac OS, you get their gorgeous San Francisco font, which is a variable font and has all these really amazing superpowers. So you're basically tapping into a font that the operating system has spent hours and days and designers have just completely perfected that font for the operating system. And you just get to use it. You just get to say system UI and boom, you have a font that's optimized for every single language that that operating system can serve. And you know that you get all the weights without downloading extra weights and the list goes on of why it's awesome. So for my body text, my paragraphs and other things like that, I like to keep them as legible and normal as possible and like unexciting, I guess. Um, and so I use the system UI keyword. Now your head, headers and other things, there's those are places for using a decorative font or something a lot, that's a lot more fun. So anyway, that's what I'm doing with system UI here. The H1, H2, H3, I'm leaving them the default font size, but I'm changing their font weight to somewhere in the middle ground. They're a little too bold. Uh, here, we can even comment it out to see what it looks like. Yeah, it's a little too bold. It's not that big of a change. And then we have a small here that says line height 1.5. And this is the small here. I think this is a small here. And I set the line height to 1.5 because it was a little too squishy before. And I wanted to give it some space. Oh, look, I even say that right here. It's otherwise too bunched up. I said squishy uh, today, but I said bunched up earlier. Same thing. All right, logical properties. Let's get into these. Good, because I've introduced them a couple times, and it's time to kind of break them down for anyone who's not familiar with logical properties. So notice the padding on body is, body is using logical properties, block start and block end, to specify the side of the box. Okay, logical properties are all about specifying the size or the side of the box. Logical pro properties will be used extensively throughout the rest of the code lab. They too, like a rem unit, adapt to a user. So. We'll get, okay, yeah, this layout can be tra translated into another language and set to a natural writing mode of document direction so the user is accustomed to their native language. Logical properties unlock support for this with only one definition of space, direction, and alignment. One definition to rule them all, as opposed to managing margin left in left to right languages and then swapping all of the margin lefts to margin right in a right to left language. That can be uh, a lot of work managing that where you could have just said margin inline start and then you don't care. You, in Latin, it was the same thing as left for you, and it could be in any other language at any other time, and you're gonna have proper spacing. So if you're building a button with an icon, uh, think about these things, or a gap, but we'll get in that. Okay, so anyway, here's a good example. Latin here is shown blocks going top to bottom and inline going left to right. We have Hebrew here showing blocks going top to bottom, but inline going right to left, and Japanese going, um, let's see, it's top to bottom, right to left, and it's, uh, yeah, we see our blocks are going from this way and our inline is traveling a downward direction. And all of this you get for, um, you'll have proper spacing if you're using logical properties. Um, and we'll, uh, I like to think about them too, like in a stage or on the mountain. So like I'm a snowboarder skier. And when we're looking up the mountain and we're talking about our, our run and how we wanna travel down it, um, it can be really confusing because when we're looking up the mountain and we say left, 
um, it means something different than when we're looking down the mountain and we say left. So what we do, what we do is we say skiers left or skiers right, and that way the person kind of takes their their physical body out of the equation of the measurement and actually imagines themselves at the top of the mountain looking down. And that's what skiers left means: is you're always putting yourself positioned at the top of the mountain looking down, and then skiers left. Another uh, thought process that's similar to this is like you have starboard and port on a boat. These are sides of the boat that aren't about where you're standing right now. Because the left side of the boat is different if you're in the back of the boat looking forward, if you're in the front of the boat looking backward, left is different. So by saying starboard and port, you're literally taking your own personal physical space out of the way that you would talk about the side of the boat. And you talk about a side of the boat that's logical that everyone on the boat, no matter where they're standing, can understand which side of the boat you're on. So hopefully you're like, okay, uh, that's fine. And you know, maybe you want that and hopefully it sounds desirable. It's a small switch and it sounds like you'll see a lot of new words in here like inline and block. And trust me, with just a little bit of practice, you can easily get your way out of margin left and margin right and into margin inline start and margin inline end and start to build your experiences that reach a wider audience without having to think about more. You literally will spend a little bit of time up front right now learning logical properties and reach more users uh, with less CSS. So the results are very exciting. It does take a little bit of learning. So hopefully this is a good primer into why that's important. All right, CSS grid layouts. The grid uh, CSS property is a powerful layout tool with many features for tackling complex tasks. You'll be building a few simple grid layouts and one complex layout. You'll also be working from the in outside in from a macro to a micro layout. Your spacing custom properties will become critical as not just for padding or margin, but for column sizes, border radiuses, a radii, that's just fun to say, and more. So here's a screenshot of Chrome DevTools overlaying each CSS grid at one time. Right, here we go. Let's go turn that on. So you can pop into your, open your DevTools and pull up our demo site, and you can start turning on these grid badges. So you can see that they're uh, labeled here, 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 here. You can see everywhere where there's a CSS grid, and you can just go turn these things on. Boop, boop, boop. You can go turn them all on. Boop, 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 boop. Now you can see how all the spacing is working across the whole thing. You can see the gap and you can see the, the container that's inside of them. And it helps you figure out like what is the spacing and how is the spacing work inside of here. And we'll probably use those to debug our issue that we saw earlier. And you can also find these things in the layout tab right here. So if you go to the layout tab and scroll down, you'll see every single grid that's on the page. You can go to the grid nice and quick. You can change the color of the grid. So notice this one's like a, a salmon. And I'm like, no, no salmon, hot pink. Right, bam, uh, you can change it. And that's really nice for making um, a picture or just understanding the different ones. So you can change the color. Oh, look, I made it hot pink in that picture too. <laughs> I would, I would make it hot pink. I'm a big fan. Uh, okay, so that's a little bit about um, layout overlay tools and stuff like that. I think those are really fun and interesting. And let's start with our first grid layout. So this is for main. So main, if we look at our HTML, is wrapping everything. I'll pop that right underneath. I'll just go to the bottom here. Our main. So our main has display grid, a gap of space XL. So you can see the XL space is right here. Because really that's the only um, we have one, we have two children in here. We have the form and we have an H1 as children of main. And then we're placing content center, uh, which oh, we could have a whole episode on just what placing content versus place, placing items is, but it's trying to put things into the center as a group. And then we have some padding, spacing small. Spacing small was, remember, one rem, so we're going to see that one a lot in here. Okay, uh, let's move on to our more complex layout. This is our form layout, because if we look right now, we're still not responsive. And we want to we want to get there. Let's talk about this layout here. And notice how it is now responsive. So what happened? First off, the form needs to be explicit about its maximum growth size. This is not a normal CSS property that you need to put on a layout, but in this particular one, we had to tell the grid that it's okay to grow up to this size. Like if I comment this out, essentially it won't go into the two column layout anymore because it's a little too eager to wrap. And by giving it a max width, did I say width? There's a width in here. Max inline size. Logical properties, they still slip into like the old verbiage. I've been over width and left for over 10 years, you know? So anyway, I'm still working my way out of it. So max inline size. Now we have um, the availability. We've told the grid layout algorithm that it's okay to grow up to this size. You thought that that would be the default, 
but it's not. It's a weird critical thing, and, it, and it's critical in this particular layout because of this that we've done down here. Repeat, auto fit, min, max, min. And we'll break this down in just a second. So we've got gaps in here. This is a row gap, and this one is a column gap. So we've got them just slightly different so that when we go into this view, there's more space here. And when we go into this view, there's a little less in that one. We're align, aligning items to flex start. So check this out um, here. Let's go to uh, display. I'm going to pop this open in debug mode so that we can go look at our current version in debug. Pop open the dev tools. And I want to look at some of our spacing. So there's that spacing. Here's our grid. And we'll grow like this. OK, first off, um, well, look, we can actually even go into here and show some of this stuff. Here's our flex start. Is it showing it to us here? I don't see the little arrows. I see our gap. So if you hover over the gap, you can see the gap. I can see that we have the grid icons, but flex start should be showing some little arrows. Essentially, what flex start is doing with the align items is notice how the bottoms here aren't the same. If I got rid of that property, it stretches them to fit. It should stretch them to fit. Well, so that was my understanding of what was happening because our form has two sections and our whole goal of setting them to align items is because stretch is the default and we wanted their intrinsic size to come through. Maybe we'll see that more in a second. But that was the goal of that is we wanted to allow each of these to be their own size instead of being stretched to the same size. It just made more sense that each of these sections could bring their own height uh, to the table based on their content. Okay, let's go to the um, definition here of repeat, auto fit, min, max, min. So the way that you can get wrapping with a CSS grid is you have to give it an algorithm that it's called like a placement algorithm where it's going to try to place new columns until it hits the edge and then it'll place another one. And with repeat, this is how you kind of tap into that is you're repeating an algorithmic concept. We're going to repeat auto fit. So that's how it's trying to auto fit these items into there. We're going to say, here's a min and a max range for you to specify for each of these items when you're placing them, uh, CSS layout grid. We want to minimally have it be at least 10 characters wide, but have it go up to 100%. And that's because, look, it can go up to 100% here, right? We're talking about these sections, but we don't want it to go below 10 characters. We want it to have at least uh, a, a column of text that can be read. And so we've set a minimum, um, but we've also set a minimum that allows it to grow. And then a maximum here of 35 characters. And that's what's locking it at this size here. That's a size of 35 characters. Uh, and I thought 35 characters was really nice for reading things like this, like these notifications. Um, having them at 35 characters starts the text wrapping at about a spot where I thought legibility was right. So setting a max inline size to something with characters or setting your columns to characters is really great for text content because you're essentially articulating a width that's based on reading. And so, right, you want a human to be able to read it. We know that like paragraphs are optimally between 60 and 75 characters wide. And so we can make our little smaller sections be half of that and just have a nice reading length so that they're not going too long. And so that's how we, we clamped our sizes here is we pass this min max function, which allows a column to be flexible, but we also tap into the auto fit capabilities and we repeat that. So as many children that show up in this grid will attempt to be placed this way. And since we gave it the max inline size of something large, it says, oh, I've reached a large space that's okay for me to grow to. I'll go ahead and wrap these items into two. Cool, that was our most complex layout that we have here. And it looks like there's a lot of notes in here that you could go read about also in case uh, you wanna review how that particular layout function worked. This is a very common layout for me to do. I never remember how it's written. So if you're like looking at this going, can he write that without looking? The answer is no. I'll get really close because uh, I think about it like RAM here, me and Yuna, because uh, you have repeat, auto fit, min max, RAM. Anyway, that's one of the ways we try to re uh, remember it. Maybe that'll help you. Okay, let's move on to the section layout here. We have display grid with a gap. Oh, this is a classic one for me. So I often I'll employ grid just to get a gap because margin is a lot less easy to manage. It's not dynamic with the number of children. You always have to make an exception for the first or the last one. And with gap, you just get to sort of like, let's see, we have a link to this doc yeah, here. Boop. It's at the top of the chat here, but maybe you didn't get the history there. No worries. Okay. Um, so our section, I call, yeah, I call these just for gap all the time. I'm like, I'm display grid. I don't need you to do anything else because display grid by default stacks items vertically. They're blocks, just like divs naturally are. 
but by making a container display grid, then you can start to use gap. And so it's essentially just a way for you to say, hey, take this layout that's already a block level layout, but give it some gap. So I call it just for gap. So our sections now have that, and that's between our headers and the field sets. Our headers and the field sets now have that space. Okay, let's check out our field set elements here. Let's pop those in, paste our styles. So we're zeroing out the padding. We're setting display to grid, because again, we're gonna bring in some gap. Notice our gap is one pixel. That's a very unique uh, thing, and we'll go over that in just a second, because we're gonna create in this layout here, let me get rid of our overlay. If we zoom in, do you see that little hairline right there? It'd be really tempting to make that a border, but then you'd have to do border bottom, border bottom, border bottom, not last item, no border bottom or whatever, right? You'd have to make an exception. And so instead, I made a gap of one pixel, and later when we go put the color in, we'll put a color on the whole field set, and since there's a gap one pixel between each, we get a hairline border, border in quotes, between each element, which also means you could like animate this whole thing and slide it in and out, and anyway, that's why I did that. That's where the one pixel comes from, is we're getting that hairline border. We're also setting the border radius to look var space small, one rem. So we have a nice border here, one rem, and the overflow is set to hidden. Okay, cool, let's move on. Field set item. So these are each item inside of the field set. Boop. Display grid again. Right. Okay. Yeah. We're using grid throughout the whole entire thing. So just get ready to see lots of display grid. Then we have grid template columns. So our first one is var space large. So our first column. If you look to see here, let's go into our. I'll save this. Pull this open. If we inspect here, let's set up our field set item. Um, this is our, here, I'll just zoom in here. This is our column we just created, that large one, and that created a space for the icon to exist. And then here's the gap that we threw in there. And our padding. So we added some uh, padding amongst all the sides as well. Ooh, I have a feeling that this is where our bug is right here. Hmm. Let's see if I'm right by the time we get to this later, uh, because this is a physical side. This is all the sides physically, and I'm pretty sure that, uh, well, mm -hmm. Maybe that's not it, because right and left are the same. Okay, we'll see it. Anyway, um, this isn't logical. This is all the physical sides, and we can break that out into the logical sides, but it looks like, eh, we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Um, we've got our gap. Uh, that was between our icons here. So yeah, our, essentially what was interesting about this layout is the grid template columns, the first one uses our spacing elements, right? Because we're choosing from the harmony that's in our app, and we're creating a space for the icons to live inside of, and we'll center them inside of there soon. So this layout is responsible for centering the icon and the checkbox, uh, associated labels and controls. The first column of the grid template uh, creates a column wider than the icon, so a child has somewhere to be centered within. Centering is really hard. There's like five different types of centering in CSS, so it is a difficult thing. It's also not just CSS's fault. Centering itself is conditional and contextual, and there's, anyway, like I said, there's a lot of different types of centering. I have a whole post on web.dev. It's like my top five centering techniques, and you can go find that uh, article to learn more about how I think about centering. I also pit them against each other and say which one's the best, uh, like it's a robot battle. Anyway, uh, this, lay the, this layout demonstrates how many design decisions really have to be made inside of the custom properties. So paddings, gaps, and columns were all sized within the harmony of the system. Perfect. Let's talk about our field set item picture. Let's grab this, drive it down here. Okay, we've got block size and inline size. So we're talking specifically about this um, icon, the icon is within a picture element. And the reason that we did that is it is a visual item and we're able to sort of add some, uh, well, you could go look at the HTML to see, but there was the aria hidden property in there and some other things. And I just like wrapping images and pictures, uh, it just seems to make sense. Plus you get an, a containing element that you can style uh, like this. So we're setting the block size of the inline size to space XL. We're setting the clip path to 50%, which we'll see soon. Uh, clip path of 50% with circle will give you a perfect circle around any element. And then we're able to animate that percentage in there to give the appearance of a grow or shrinking circle on the element. It's kind of cool. So we're kind of like clipping it like a mask, and then we're going to adjust the mask to do the effects. Like, here, let's just go check out that effect really quick because we'll get there. See as I tabbed in, oh, we still have um, reduced motion. Reduce motion, we'll go no emulation. Ah, see how the tab kind of grew in right there? And that's all being done with clip path. Cool, display inline grid and place content center. So that's setting the picture element to a grid and then setting its content in the center and that's gonna center the icon inside of the space that's been, uh, that it's articulated here. Perfect, let's move on to 
this one. Ooh, our first pseudo class selector with the is pseudo class functional pseudo class selector. Gotta love them. Okay, so field set item. If it is a picture or an input type checkbox, place self center. So if it's a picture or input type checkbox, ah, let's see. If I go undo this, let's look at our checkbox adjust back. To, um, yep. See, it's at start start. So is our item here in the uh, the picture. And we'll set place self center center, and we'll see these things center inside of the. Ooh, did I skip a heading element? I saw a little comment in there. Let's see, what was that? I think you skipped the header element styling. Um, the headers, like you mean like these headers, those were in the beginning. I didn't really style them very much. They're kind of unstyled. But maybe we'll come back to that. Thanks for pointing that out. We'll see if I um, did in fact skip that. Um, okay, so we centered our icons. We've got some SVG work to do. So we're gonna set the size of our SVG that we like. We're gonna set those to block size medium. So you can see that they shrunk just a little bit there, which means I can also go to the top and get rid of this style here, this SVG block size two, uh, because we're using our spacing variable that we created earlier to stay within the harmony of our sizing. Let's look at small stack. This is our only utility class that's in the whole thing. I'll paste that here. I called it small stack because it's just got an extra small gap between it. So this class small stack is on a few elements inside of here. And you could see them, uh, you could see them spaced out as we did that. Right, not a whole lot of change, but it gave us this ability to put some space between um, a few elements. Let's inspect it here. So we've got, here's a small stack. So you could see it right there. We're just putting some space between this um, header message here and the small. And then we've also got one being used here, right? So we have consistent gap between them. And we're just, again, kind of using just for gap. Is a very, it's a very similar layout as the other ones we've seen. Okay, cool. Let's look at our input type checkbox. Ah, here's something I really like to do, is increase the size of a checkbox. So if we scroll down here, you can see how it grew. Let me cut that back out. You can see our normal size checkboxes are like almost the exact size of my mouse cursor, uh, which requires a lot of fine pointing. If I set the inline size and the block size, so essentially the height and the width to one of our spacing elements, look, I get a nice uh, larger checkbox and they're all made with vectors, so they look great. Um, and now I have a much easier hit area. And we can adjust this later if we like inside of a media query for um, coarse touch for finger and make that even larger. So we could go from a small to a medium sized and make it even easier for fingers to tap. So we'll see if we get there. All right, things to try. Oh yeah, open up the elements panel, turn on those grid badges, start looking at the gap. Yep, so let's click in the gap in the styles pane. Um, and there's all sorts of good things that you can start to do in here. Like if I look at this icon here, this is our picture element. See this inline grid icon here? So here we have display, inline grid, and there's this icon. If you click this icon, it will show you which um, kind of alignment it's using for that particular grid, and you can change them. And it's really nice. You can get a nice visual for how you're positioning things. OK, media queries. Yeah, the following CSS adapts the styles based on viewport size, orientation, within, and with the intent to adjust spacing or arrangement to be optimal within a given uh, viewport. Let's grab. Both of these. So these are essentially um, mobile first. And the reason that we can tell that they're mobile first is because they're using min width. And we're um, if the if it's 540 and above, we're going to increase some spacing. And if it's even larger than 800, we're going to go even more. So this is kind of like how we're increasing our compact. So we're going from a compact layout on mobile. Uh, and as we get more space, we're going to get more uh, spacing there. So could you see the shift? So here's the compact layout. We go here, we get a little bit more spacing. We grow in a little bit more spacing. Oh, I see, we've only targeted main. So let me save this. Let's open up our demo here. I'll reload and we'll go onto main here. So we can see our padding around the edge, but padding doesn't really stick around with the dev tool. So I'm gonna use VizBug here really quick. Here's our padding. Let me hide VizBug. This is just a design tool I made that uh, helps you visualize a bunch of different and interesting things on the page. In this particular case, padding. So I'm going to select that element so the padding stays. And as I resize, we can watch the padding adjust. Right? Just shrunk right there. Shrinks. And it's going to shrink again. And it shrinks again. So we'll be able to use um, this similar concept within more elements inside of here to see these shrink too. Right now, these aren't shrinking or growing with the rest. And we'll, um, we'll get there. Well, it took a second. All right, so cool. I'll just refresh in here, come back to our demo. And uh, VizBug is free to download. Um, if you want, you can uh, send me a message, and I'll send you a link to it. Or just look it up. It's V-I-S-B-U-G. Here, I'll just send that right here. 
also a web kit in here. I'll just go to visbug.web.app. You can also try it before you install it here. It's a Chrome extension that also works in Safari and Firefox. So you can get these nice visual tools in all the other browsers. Okay, and let's talk about our form. Hey, look, it's another repeat. Uh, no auto fit. Oh, no, it is auto fit. So we have another RAM layout. Okay, let's grab our form and pop this in down here. Roll this open. Okay, so what are we doing? We have a custom property called repeat that's scoped locally to the form here, and we've set it to auto fit. The reason that we did that is so that in a media query for orientation landscape in MinWit 640, this is when our device goes into uh, landscape mode. So we're having at least 640 pixels wide of on the device. So we need to make sure that there's enough width to go to two columns. And is the device in, in landscape actually? And if it is, we want to ensure that it's not auto fitting that it's actually, in fact, two columns. We're being very explicit about it here. We're, we're kind of taking the auto layout out of it. We're not auto fitting at all. We're saying two columns layout, grid, two columns. Don't do anything other than two. And that's how we can tell it specifically um, on that, um, in this particular scenario here, what size and layout that we want. So we'll just briefly go over this one here. We have a repeat of our repeat. So that's our auto fit by default, but maybe it's two. Min max at, oh, look, it's almost the exact same one. A minimum of 10 characters, but able to scale up to 100%. You'll see that this is a way to make this area more flexible. There's CSS trick, tricks articles, very specific about this value inside of min max. And it's pretty tricky, um, but ultimately this is what you can take away from it is something similar to this. And then a max at 35 characters. And so that's allowing us to, again, be specific about two columns on a device that is in landscape mode. Cool. All right, field set item. Looks like we got a media query for this one. Where was our field set item before? I'll go put this next to it. Uh, right here. Paste that. And what do we got in here? We have a field set item, grid template columns. Ooh, that even gave us some space. I saw it. So we're saying if the browser width is above 540 pixer, pixels, pixers, uh, we're going to set the grid template column size to XXL. So it was just large, and now it's double large, still having a flexible unit for the rest of it here. We're going to change the gap to be a small gap, and we're going to adjust the padding here. So, oh, look, I think this is going to be our padding. Look, there's our zero. Do you remember when we went right to left and there was like a side that had no padding? It was a mystery. I'm pretty sure that that's it. Okay, we're gonna, that's gonna be fun. I'm pretty sure that's it. Uh, anyway, so we have top, right, bottom, left. Oh, that's totally it. That's, we're gonna get it. Um, anyway, and we'll come back and fix it. That sounds like fun. And so we're adjusting our padding based on more space. So we should see it grow. Yeah, that means we can save this and come back into our code pen over here, launch VizBug again, pull up our padding tool and stick it on these items and watch them adjust. Yep, there's our smaller amount of padding. And as we get above 540, it grew, and that left-hand side went to right zero. In fact, let's just try. Oh, look, my directionality on my document is gone. Uh, oh, that's because CodePen doesn't have it. So let's say um, dir, oh, let me type in here, dir equals right to left. Let's just nip this bug right now. There it is. Okay, so we're already experiencing it. I'll uh, query in here. I'll look at our field set item. That was the one that was in question. We have padding here is being specified that the left-hand side is zero. The left is zero. Let's fix it, and we're going to fix it with logical properties. Check it out. Let's come into here, our uh, specify uh, where we wrote that. So what we're going to change is when you use the shorthand of padding, it's all the physical sides. The quick way to get to the logical version is to say padding block. Now that's going to be the logical sides of things, and that's going to be top first. Oh, I need a semicolon here. Here's our top. So we'll just take that right out of there and take the bottom out. Oh, look, they're the same. Guess what? We don't even have to write that then. We'll just say padding block. It'll repeat them just like margin does. Then we'll say padding in line. And we'll take these two values. Let's see. Wait. So we had top, right, bottom, left. So zero is the inline start. And our right is this one. OK, we'll cut that old value out of there. We'll hit save. So notice how nothing changed in our layout over here. I'll refresh. I'm going to have to add our attribute again over here. We'll say direction equals right to left. Yeah, yeah. We're fixing bugs in a live demo. That is uh, exciting for me. I don't know if that's exciting for you. Anyway, I'll have to go update the example here, but that was a okay, critical lesson, right, of when a physical uh, padding and spacing property 
bit you as you try to go into another writing mode. And um, anyway, uh, you be careful when you're using the padding and margin shorthands. I often will expand mine into the uh, shorthands that you saw here, padding block and padding in line. You might even be familiar with something like padding X or padding Y, where people have tried to give you the ability to do left and right in just one line of CSS. So anyway, you have that with logical properties, and it just saved our bacon. Look at that. I'm happy with that. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next section. Adaptive color. How much time do we have? It's 12.01. we got like 30 minutes. All right, cool. Uh, hopefully, we can get to some questions. Let's burn through. I'm going to burn through the color section a little faster. Let's, um, let's try to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, we're going to adapt to dark and light color preferences. We're going to have a color scheme derived from a brand hex, and we're going to have accessible colors because, of course, and yeah, we're going to take our layout, which is looking like this, which is kind of just like skeleton and bones, and we're going to turn it into something harmonious and uh, have a color scheme. And we're going to do that with HSL. It sounds for hue, saturation, lightness. There's many ways to write color. Uh, HSL is unique in that it has a lightness value, which is really common for people to say, I just want like a lighter color. Uh, and you can stay within a single hue, and then you can adjust the saturation. So we're going to create one with HSL and calc, because we can do a calculation on the values that we pass into the HSL function. So let's scroll down here to custom properties. In this section, we're going to build a set of custom properties for use within the rest of our styles, similar to our spacing system that we built. It's going to be a color system. Oh, look, that's like literally what's written right there. Assume the brand color for your app is pound zero AF, right? A designer always gives you a, a hex value, and that's not useful for us to do light and darken unless you're in SAS or some sort of preprocessor. And we want to be in just vanilla CSS today. So our first task is to convert the hex value to HSL. <gasps> How do I convert? I'll show you. So if I just highlight anything here, so I hit Command Shift C um, in my dev tools to get to this. This is it's called the uh, element inspect thing. Anyway, click the element that I want to inspect. I'm just going to set the color to that uh, hex value, and it looks like a nice blue. And watch this, as I hold shift, and here I'll just zoom in, I'm gonna hold shift and click, and convert that to HSL. So DevTools will convert colors for you. Look, I can go back to a three-digit hex. You saw the six-digit hex. We've got our RGB and our HSL, and I'm gonna go take these color channels out of there. So H, the hue is 200, the saturation is maximum at 100%, and the lightness is at 50%. So this is like a really bright middle blue or something like that. And I like how HSL can read like that too. Okay, so we took out our color channels. This conversion reveals your brand's color channels. Now we can use calc on it. Great. So here's our brand channels. I'm going to stick these into our root. Boop, up into the top. Okay, so it's, oh, I don't need that. There we go. So there's our hue, saturation, lightness, nice and named. These three channels, we can use these and build upon them for a bunch of variants. And I think that's the exciting part about colors is when you have like a base and then you're building off all these different trees um, of color systems. So since your color, my color scheme is dark by default, that's how we're going to start today. So you don't have to work that way, but that's how I'm going to work. I'm going to start that by saying uh, text one and text two. So we're going to start creating custom properties that use the HSL values. So the first one here, text one, is going to be of the same hue. So it's going to be 200, which is going to be a blue. It's going to be very mildly saturated, but very light. Our text two, right, this is our dark theme. So our text needs to be a light, a light text on a dark color. We'll get to our dark surfaces in a second. But notice that they're barely saturated and they're pretty light. So they're, they're not quite to white. 100% in lightness would make it white. And then text two is the same little mild amount of saturation, but a little less bright white. So that's going to give us our secondary text color that's kind of subdued. Uh, you know, like you might choose a light gray or something like that. Scroll down. Let's grab our surface colors. Put those right underneath. So here's our surface. We have the same hue. Notice the hue is just carried right through all these. The saturation is still pretty low on these, but notice the lightness. So our surfaces are dark. They're almost near black. We have 10%, 15%, 20 and 25%. So we have four variations of dark, dark blue to use as surfaces and two very light, uh, light blue colors to use as text colors. And if we come back to our example, notice how everything in here has a blue harmony to it. And this is the way that we're doing that. And if I switch to dark, you can see that the dark even has a blue harmony to it. And this is all through HSL. All right, so what's our next section here? We've got a light theme. Yes, let's build upon the light theme. And also, we're not using any of these yet, but we'll get there. So we'll take this whole media query here. We'll pop it underneath our root. We'll say if the user prefers color scheme light, we want these colors inside of the root. So brand should be full 
uh, color here. So full hue, full saturation, full lightness, exactly as the designer gave it to us. That's our brand color. Did we do brand up here? I don't think we did brand up there. Did we do brand? Oh, look, I missed it. Brand, brand should go underneath here. Ah, and notice this one has saturation cut by two because when you're in a dark color scheme, you do not want a really bright, vibrant, saturated color. You want desaturated colors. At night, a, a blue will naturally have a lot of vibrance to it. And so we cut it in half here. That's what I meant by calc. We calculated off of the brand color a half saturated um, brand blue. And then in the light theme, we go full on. Okay, so here's also, we're gonna put these text colors in our light color scheme here. Let me pop these under here. Excellent. So, uh, wait a sec, that's our old one, isn't it? Yeah, here's our light theme. Here's the text colors we want. I was like, the lightness on these is really high. These are like white text colors. I'm like, we're not building that. We need to build a dark color scheme. So here we go, text one, same hue, vibrant saturation, and really dark, 10%. Again here, but not quite as dark. So 20% difference in the darkness um, and look 20% darkness or difference here. So you can kind of like our, our text colors, each of them have a 20% difference in lightness and that's how we're getting that nice variation in them. You can play with these numbers to see what you like. But a strong tip too is notice how we're in the 80s and the 60s and down here we're in the 10s and the 20s. If you keep a range of about 50% between your text color and your surface color in the lightness channel, you can get yourself into a really healthy spot for accessible colors. So you're gonna ensure there's enough contrast because your lightness has a big enough gap between the values that you're choosing um, and you can control that here in your HSL. So you can kind of guesstimate your way there, but always test. Always go back through and test and make sure everything's looking good. So those are our text colors. Here, let's pull in our surface colors. Look at these ones. These ones are almost white. So we have surface one, a 90%, 99%, 96%, and 85%. So they're still all blue. They're still barely saturated because light blue colors or just light colors don't need a lot of saturation for that to come through, but they're almost white. And that's why in our layout here, look at this layout. It is almost nearly white. Some of these look white, in fact, but they are not. And you can tell, so this is gonna be 99% white probably on this one. So anyway, let's move on to using the color system. Yes, the exciting part. Let's go to our body and use our surface one and text one. I like it when my surface and text numbers, so text one, surface one, you can use them as a pair. Uh, and using them as a pair is a good way to think about, uh, again, good contrast in your colors. So let's see, underneath our custom props in our body here, we'll paste this. And immediately we should start to see something exciting. Yes, I'm on a dark theme as my color preference. I can see that the background has been used that surface one and the text color is text one. So everything is that nice, bright, primary text one color. Cool, let's start making our exceptions and build this thing out. Our field set item has the surface three background color. All right, field set item has the background of surface three, we'll see that pop in here. Excellent. The picture element has a background color of surface four. Build set item picture, here we go. So we're just using the color system that we built now. And look, yeah, we're, so by using that lightness adjuster in these colors and those uh, surfaces, we're now able to create these different surface colors and textures um, just by adjusting that lightness. So everything's on brand, on theme, but still um, has a nice, contrast and a nice complementary color set to each other. So let's see, we've got our field set item SVG. Let's set item SVG right here. That's gonna be filled with text too. So that's our lighter color, a little more subdued and there it is right there. So it's not quite as bright as these ones are. A little bit more subdued, also a little bit more blue. So as we got a little bit lighter in the color, more of the saturation came through. Uh, let's see, focus, ah, so this is a new selector, isn't it? We haven't done focus within yet. So we've got focus within SVG. Let's just pop that right underneath here. So this says, if the field set item and any of its children have focus, find the SVG and give it a fill of brand. So if I hit tab and I focus into here or even just click into one of these, look at how that goes to blue. So we're bringing our brand blue color into this um, by using focus within. So I really like focus within as a interactive, um, CSS pseudo class, it allows you to do a lot of really cool stuff because as people are using things, you can highlight other parts of the UI and I'm pretty sure we continue to do that in this. Okay, so here's our small, small color. I think this is a new selector too, huh? Do we have a small in here? Maybe it's at the very bottom. Oh yeah, we had small with like that like line height adjustment, huh? There it is. So it's gonna be, it's gonna get the secondary color, right? That makes sense. It's a small, 
secondary color set, text two, so that's going to be these. And there they go. They pushed back just a little bit so they don't compete as much with the headers. And lastly, for dark form controls, we're going to add color scheme dark light to our root element. And what this does is this signals to the browser that you have a light and a dark theme. And did you see our sliders just got dark and they got subdued? The, the brand color is now lighter. And look at our checkboxes. They're dark. I'm going to go ahead and uh, comment that out again so we can see. White sliders, white checkboxes. That's the light theme that the browser supplies. And we have a very vibrant blue. I'll bring this back in. And we'll go to a slightly less bright blue um, as well as a um, dark checkbox and dark slider. So really cool touch to put on your um, interface is that color scheme. And the color scheme does have other impacts on your page, but since we've set the background colors and stuff on it, um, it's all good. So anyway, let's keep moving on. Adaptive animation. So now we have, we have adapting color, we have adapting layouts, we have adaptive spacing, we have adaptive inputs, right? We can use this from all these different interfaces. Um, we need to do adaptive animation. Our border looks like we did something wrong. Our field set border looks like it needs something. What does it need? Our field set has border radius. Does it need a border, like one pixel solid? I feel like it needs a surface color, surface three. Mm, can't quite see it. How about surface two? I'm going to have to go check that out. I'm sure it's in there somewhere, but it looks like our border is, um, oh, hey, uh, yeah, we've got someone saving it. Yes, thank you. Surface 4, Surface 4 for border and background. Thanks for saving me there. Y'all are so helpful. <laughs> I appreciate it. Ah, that does. That looks nice. Okay, because look, now our border matches our little hairline because we set the back. This was a critical thing we almost missed. Thank you so much, Donovan. Appreciate that following along, keeping me in my spot. This is awesome. Okay, so what we want to do now is we want to add some animation, but we only want to add it for folks that won't throw up from it. Uh, I hope that's obvious. <laughs> anyway, and it's really easy to do in CSS, and I'll show you how. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to our field set. We'll take and we'll add a new transition in here. Uh, I don't usually do that. I might change up how we do that today because here's prefers reduced motion, no preference. Here's our transition. I want to only add transitions if it's okay. Oh, you know what it is, is we're transitioning the box shadow and that's okay. Okay, so we're gonna go to our field set. Totally cool to transition a box shadow. And when the field set has focus within, we're gonna increase that box shadow. And that's gonna give us a lifted effect. That's not gonna be super noticeable here in the dark theme because dark shadows are really tough. But in our light theme, you can see that it's now lifted off the bottom here. So if I click off, it kind of folds back down. And as I interact with it, it lifts. Notice how this one is focused. So we've got um, like a focus on this item here. We've got a lift, we've got icons highlighting and all of that coming from with focus within. So let's keep building upon this. So our field set item, we're going to transition the background color. Color is totally okay to transition for folks who need reduced motion. So we're going to set transition, background color, 0.2 seconds ease. I like ease. It's like a default um, easing. See, we're really starting to come along in here, right? So field set item, we were doing the background color. Oh, we haven't set the focus within yet. Okay, so we're able to transition that back color, but we're not changing it yet. So let's go ahead and change it. Field set item focus within. And we'll set the background to var surface two when that is focus within. And there it is. Now it looks darker. So, right, we're bringing attention to this particular zone. And when we made this darker, look at this surface, it popped right out. So our icon gets to shine. Cool stuff. We've only got four surface colors in this app. And look at how dynamic it is. You don't need a whole bunch of colors. You can do stuff with just a little bit. Okay, here's the one that we do want to be reduced. And this is why I like to tuck them inside of this media query here. So we're going to be field set item picture. Let's find that here. Pop it underneath. Paste. So what I like about this is it says, um, um, prefers reduced motion, no preference. This is essentially somebody, a user that has not changed the value. Um, AKA, they're okay with motion. And if they're okay with motion, then we're like, okay, well, let's go do some cool stuff. Like animate the clip path, which definitely has a grow and a shrink animation um, that is a little wobbly looking. And it's it's easy enough for us to just to put this all behind this little media query here. So this media query, if the user is okay with motion, let's grab the picture element. Let's set its clip path to 40%. So we shrunk it from what it was. It was 50%, which fit its entire box. We're going to shrink a little bit. 
Uh, and then we're going to wait for focus within here. And if there's focus within, we're going to target that picture and we're going to set the clip path to 50%. So we're essentially shrinking the clip path, but when they focus inside, we're going to scale it up. And when they focus out of it, it'll scale back down. And we're going to get this little scale effect. And let's test it out as we interact with this. Look at that grow. That's so satisfying. Little, little touches for that UX. Okay. Um, and that's it. That's the clip path animation for there. And congratulations. We have finished it. What time is it? We've got 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, awesome. Let me go check out what we got in the section over here. Let's see. For performance, should we animate the opacity of the pseudo element with a box shadow? Um, OK, for performance reasons, there are a few things that we animated in this example that aren't typically high performing things. Um, I would recommend that if you want to be very considerate of performance, you should always animate opacity or transition or transforms, except this is, this is going to be, I don't know, a little controversial, I guess. Things that don't have a lot of surface area are fine to animate um, properties that aren't expensive, especially if they're not going to be pushing other elements around. So clip path is very self-contained. It's not a GPU accelerated animation property. But as you saw, and I've done a lot of testing on old devices, clip path when done on animations in small spaces is totally fine. Furthermore, background color, which we've done a few color animations here, are also not typically GPU accelerated. Chromium is working on accelerating them so that they are GPU accelerated, but for now they're not. But again, since they're not layout impacting and they're only color um, paint impacting, they're much cheaper than things that are going to move other elements around. So you could say that I, well, and really, yeah, some of the animations in here aren't as performant as they could be, but again, they're so small uh, that they're negligible. So even on a really low end device, like I've got one right here, everything still looks really nice on there. Those even low end devices still have a really big GPU or not a big GPU, but have a big brain these days and can get a lot done. So that's a good question though. Um, and clip path and background color are set to be GPU animated properties before Q2 next year, something like that. People are hacking on it so that you won't have to worry about it. Um, but it's a great question. All right, I'm going to go to the Q&A section and not read that chat anymore because I'm hoping people packed this thing up. Woohoo, we did. Did they get upvoted? They did get upvoted. Sweet. Okay, so I'm going to start the ones that got a thumbs up first, and then it's like top to bottom ones with thumbs up, and then uh, I'll just start at the top from there. So Timmy has uh, probably off topic. Nice. But as much as we like REM, it seems challenging to build a design system using REM. Oh, this is a good one. Okay. Um, I believe the most challenging part is that design tools don't have a concept of a rim. Everything that gets done outside of the browser that gets told to you gets told to you in something other than a web unit. You get told them in pixels, which are absolute units, which is a great way to squash user preferences. You get told things in dips, maybe, and dip is an Android value, and it's like a DPI relevant value, and that's not important for you either. Um, because pixels and rims will both be DPI, anyway, whatever. Um, I think the biggest problem is something internally in a team. And so for many years, um, and still to this day, I translate pixels to REMS for designers. They don't, they don't have the means to do it. You can, you're going to have to do it for them. So um, it is challenging. But once you lay down this, the spacing system, you can. here's what I've always done is I love sitting down with designers. Take their pixel spacing system or their pixel font size system, go eyeball it into rems in your browser as close as you can but round some of the values don't use like a 0.95 rem or something like that just use one rem and then work with them to nudge the rem based system into something that they find visually pleasing and find a compromise same thing with colors they're going to give you hex and turns out the future of the internet is not hex it's in well lch lab display p3 designers are going to start giving you colors well you're going to start telling designers that they can use more colors soon. Um, and that's also on the, so basically the web is way more powerful than most design tools and the handoff sucks. So uh, it's on you to bring and help educate and translate. You've always been a translator in the front end. You're translating a wish and a dream into a reality. And sometimes that means you need to adjust the units that are being used. I hope that is mildly accessible or acceptable as an answer. I could riff on that forever, but thanks to me for the question. Uh, I want to burn on to the next one. Oh, look, we got more votes. Okay, so Lori's at the top here. I normally wrap inputs and in label elements to get the benefits you showed for the four attribute. Yes, I noticed the lab does not do this. Are there any trade-offs here? There are trade-offs. Um, they're not bad trade-offs. Some of them are design trade-offs. There's even one I think I cheated in there where I used display. Oh, no, I took out the display contents. 
because uh, I did have some wrapped in a label. Sometimes I'll wrap them in a label, like I have a GUI challenge where I built a switch element with a checkbox, and I wrapped that checkbox in a label um, because I got some nice tap functionality and some other things for free. Um, I think it can be argued that the relationship is what you're trying to build, right? You're trying to say this label and this input are together. Now you can either do that with an explicit relationship of hierarchy. You've put the checkbox in the label, letter obviously together, or you can specify it with some metadata that's attached to the elements themselves. So maybe you want the label and the checkbox to be far away from each other, but you want them to still have a relationship you'd want to use the attributes. If you want them bundled together and they're always going to be in that one little spot, maybe you want to make them parent-child relationship. I don't think there's any humongous reasons to choose one over the other. Um, the important thing is that you're thinking about it, and that is important to me. You need to be thinking about the user and thinking about the relationship between your labels and your inputs. So you're already a leg up on a lot of other folks. I don't know of any specific reasons to use or not use one. Maybe there's a blog post someone wants to share. Um, great question, though. Okay, is it more preferable to use rem for root space instead of m or pixel? This is another good one. Okay, so um, I use rem because, again, I like the whole unit nature of it, one rem being the, the base font size that the user has. And so I know that if I use one rem as a spacing unit somewhere, it's going to be uh, akin to how their brain wants to see the font size. So like if they have a large font size, they're going to want more space between their elements also. And so using rem i get to bring that throughout the whole application rem being a very global root centric won't change value m can change on you so you might use m one m in one location and one m in another location and get a different result and so i use rem because i want consistency in that spacing system if i want a contextual spacing system that builds off like a little contextual font size uh, m is a great choice and pixels i don't like to use pixels unless i'm doing something like border radius or absolute positioning. Um, and there's a couple other exceptions where like, I don't really need the border radius to be based on the user's font size. Like there's usually a border radius that we want and it's a pixel value. Totally fine to use a pixel value there. Um, so again, it's thinking about um, the user and what is the user bringing and, and do I want their preferences to travel into this particular design element that you're working towards? So I use rem. Um, there's also more units about to come out like the root character unit. So I really, you saw me use the CH unit in here. I love that unit, especially for sizing content, headers, small elements, paragraph elements, labels. Uh, I really love using the character unit because it's like, you really wanted to optimize for a reading length. And so you can specify it almost very specifically with the character unit. And soon we'll get root character RCH. Uh, and I don't think I'll switch to RCH for my unit, but maybe. I really like the CH unit. I also use a lot like one CH or two CH. Because um, again, they're whole units, they read well, they travel well amongst all these use cases, but the CH unit is like the M unit, it will change contextually based on its use case and location. Awesome question. Okay, let's see, haven't uh, custom properties, see, haven't custom CSS properties been abandoned for good? They definitely have not. I don't know where you heard that, that's crazy. Uh, and I don't mean that's crazy, I'm sorry, but it's like I've never heard anyone say that before. Um, but no, they're more powerful than any preprocessor variable ever. They're kind of incredibly amazing uh, in terms of reactivity. They're minimal. You can put a thousand of them on a page or more and they're all going to be performant. They are absolutely fantastic. In fact, I have a bet that custom properties are about to explode. Anyway, well, um, we, we, we talk about that later. Let's see, what are we out of time? We've got six minutes. Okay, cool. Will this be available to watch later? No, but let me share. I don't think it will, but let me share one that will. I've got this link to the existing one right here. Boop. Boop. I'll throw this in the chat. So this is my Google I.O. version. It's half the time. And I think that has a timestamp on it. Uh, who cares? Anyway, there you go. Um, really hope the Q and A questions are sorted so it follows all the likes. It did have it. I didn't think they were sorted, but I can go query them in the last little set here and make sure I get the ones that are high voted. Uh, let's see. There's one with five. There's one with eight. Let's go with the eight. Okay, Lori, could you elaborate more as to why you use gap over margins? Yes. Would you like? Uh, would you feel a little hacky to set grid without understanding more? Sure, that's fair enough. Um, like if you're not familiar with grid and you're um, and in gap, you've been using margins all this time. You don't have to start adapting gap. Um, I just found that margins generally when used on like a parent container to like lay out children, 
always came with little exceptions where it'd be like, okay, margin block start, you know, 20 pixels or one rem, like I would use, and then it was like, oh yeah, the one on the bottom or the one on the top now has extra space and it should have been hugging the container. So then it, then you have to write a new selector and you're like, first of type, that is this thing, margin block start none. Or you write a selector that's like, find all my children that are not the first child and then give them, and it's just like, it just doesn't really read that well. It also um, feels very particular, like it's um, targeting very a very specific scenario where gap is just like space will be between all the children and never around the edge. And so I'll, often what I'll do is I'll set my padding and my gap to the same custom property because then the container and the space between them is all the same. Um, and it's just a couple lines of CSS instead of maybe three or four. Um, I think it's pretty pretty common that a lot of people find um, that managing the spacing on the parent is a lot easier to adjust later than it is to go find each child and make their margin different. Here is a critical reason though to not use gap, which is if you need different spacing between your children. Gap is a one space between everything only. You can do row and column, but you can't say like the first row gets one rem and the second row gets four rem and the th you can't adjust it. So that would be a use case for margin. Like if you needed some sort of ramp as things got more spaced as they went down. Um, nice. Would you feel uh, hacky to set grid without understanding more? Oh, you're saying it would feel hacky. I mean, grid, um, yeah, we look at the CSS statistics of grid and Flexbox. They are still, uh, Flexbox is the one that's more used. Um, Gap is on Flexbox now too, but grid is still at like a low 10% of usage on web pages. So don't feel bad if grid is not super familiar for you yet. Um, but it is something I would very much say invest in. The syntax gets very familiar very quickly and uh, more familiar quickly than I think Flexbox did. Um, but anyway, that would be my thoughts there. Let's see, do we have any other high ones? Okay, any tips on how to best integrate these techniques into a design system? Like I said, work with your designers. I love sitting down with designers and saying, um, here's what I made based on what you gave me. Let's make it even better. Their eyes always notice things that mine don't, and it's a learning experience for me. Um, and I've been doing that for so long that a lot of my design decisions, like you saw in here, are based on experiences that I've had with designers when I sit down with them. Um, so I'd say work with them directly and try to help them understand the reason for relative units and the reason for making some of these decisions about color and font and stuff like that, uh, that the user is not... Basically, there's always a war between design control and design adaptation. And the more control that someone wants so that they try to put in there, the more they're going to fight the user that's just like, why can't I just read it or whatever? There's just going to be, there's always this little weird war. And so um, try to help designers fall into this space of working with existing stuff instead of trying to rain down a new design system. It's almost like um, line heights is a good one. Like designers will give you this like type ramp and they've got all these line heights for all these different font sizes. And those get really messy over time. And instead, you could have just used a unitless line height, got something approximately much closer, but that's much more dynamic and doesn't have any of the baggage of like hand managing font size and line height every time you use them somewhere. So I don't know. There's just always kind of a, a difficult and appropriate like struggle between like design control and design flexibility. And you can pick which side of that you want to be on and just help each other find a middle ground. Design systems are about finding a middle ground, um, I think, at least. You're trying to empower um, all sorts of different people. See, do you know how the will change property can optimize animation and when it should be used? Yes, the will change property is a hint to the browser that you will be changing something. It's able to, um, ahead of time, as soon as it reads that that's there, you can store in its memory that this thing will be changing. So will change is really great for things that you're going to be changing a lot. Like let's say you're hovering uh, and it's gonna be changing all sorts of different transition values. Like you're following the mouse and you're gonna be setting X and Y in a transform. That's a really good thing to tell the browser, hey, will change transform. It's about to be firing at a rapid rate at you. Like, you know, the mouse is gonna be moving at the re screen refresh rate. It's a good, way, good time to tell the browser that this thing will change. You can overdo will change. So um, you can basically prepare the browser so much that its brain explodes. That's not real. But it, it's like it will become overloaded. It will pack so much ahead of time into memory in preparation for your animations that things start to fall out. 
it's uh, it runs out of memory. And so a common thing on like a low-end device, if too many things have will change, everything starts to suffer because now nothing is optimized. Um, it's a property to be used sparingly, um, but when it's used in the right scenarios, it can be awesome. You can also conditionally apply it. So let's say your mouse entered a zone that you're going to be setting something really rapidly. You could set will change as soon as the mouse is in there. Your will changing, and, you're, and you are changing it a lot. And then the mouse exits. That thing's not going to change as much anymore. Rip the property off there. There's also a way to use will change to help your text not do a shift. So if you're transforming something with text in it, you might see the text get kind of blurry and then come back in, and then it like has this like snap effect where it goes from the GPU layer, like the little bitmap that it moved into spot, and then it goes back into a fully rendered vector thing. Um, you can tell it will change transform there, and it will maintain the um, bitmap version the whole time, so you never see that transition between like vector text and animation ready text. Um, you can keep the layer in memory. So that's about layers. Uh, will change is a great way for you to articulate layers that are going to be changing a lot or that you want to stay changed. Whew, this stuff is fun. Um, Y'all, there is a um, Discord. You should ask more questions in. Let me send a little invite over here. Check this out. Bring your questions in here. I'm happy to answer more. Boom. Uh, there is the Discord link. Please feel free to join, ask more questions. There's other channels in there too for you to ask other types of questions. Whew. I'm a little out of breath, so I have, but I had a good time. I'm so glad we fixed that bug. I gotta go update the um, the thing. What a sneaky little bug too. The physical sides of the shorthand came after us. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thanks everybody. Take it easy.